Now it's time for a perspective on the programme. We're going to take you back to the situation in Syria. Thousands of people said to be fleeing their homes, mostly Kurds, as Turkish forces advance from the north and Syrian army forces advance from the south, leaving the Kurdish forces in the middle fighting for their land. Well, with me here on set is now Deem Huri, who's formerly of Human Rights Watch, now executive director of the think tank, the Arab Reform Initiative. Thanks so much for coming in and talking Thank to you for us. having me. First of all, let's talk about the humanitarian crisis here. I mean, how bad do you think this could get? It could get very, very bad because this is a completely isolated area that already had a lot of displaced. So we're already starting with a very low baseline and we already have more than 140,000 people who have escaped the advancing Turkish uh, troops and their allies. But you could also potentially have more than 100,000 fleeing the advancing Syrian troops coming from the south. The problem is where do they go? The second issue is the humanitarian actors on the ground are very limited at this stage. Over the last few days, most international organizations have pulled out their international staff. Uh, so basically, you have an increase in needs and less and less supplies. And you add to that the fact that there were already hundreds of thousands of internally displaced living in camps. And really, the only major actor now on the ground is the Kurdish Red Crescent, basically a local Kurdish version of the Syrian Red Crescent with very limited means. Uh, so it could get very bad. So the Syrian government forces coming, if you like, to the aid of the Kurds, I mean, do you see that as, as helping the Kurds or not? Because presumably it could mean that we just get a, an even larger battle than we may have seen before. Well, I think the Kurds made a deal with Damascus under uh, Russian sponsorship. Uh, you know, were they very happy about it? They probably had to choose between two evils and they preferred to, to deal with the uh, Syrian government. Mm. So I think this may limit some of the fighting. On the other hand, as the Syrian government troops will advance into certain areas, particularly around the Deir Ezzor governorate, so they haven't actually gone there yet, the civilian population of those areas, which is mostly Arab and which actually rebelled against the regime from the early days of 2011, will likely have to flee uh, because they don't trust the government, they don't trust the uh, pro-Iranian militias that are there. Uh, we haven't seen that yet because the focus has been mostly on the border areas and sort of Kobani and, and Raqqa, but we could, we could see that in the coming days and weeks. The main problem is there's a vacuum now, and nature abhors vacuums. And the way the U.S. made its pullout, without planning for anything, without even planning for a humanitarian contingency, and frankly, the Europeans never planned for a humanitarian contingency, is just making the situation worse. So you blame the U.S. here? Of course the U.S. is to blame. I mean, they were the main international actor. Uh, you know, Trump has been saying he wants to pull out. The issue is not the pullout. The issue is how you do the pullout. You know, they've had now a couple of years to prepare negotiations to ensure that there's a smooth transition, uh, to ensure that there's a negotiated settlement and some sort of governance. But by doing it the way they did, they, we've seen what they've done. I mean, Turkey has sort of, you know, rushed in. The Syrian government has rushed in. Um, so, yeah, I blame, I blame the U.S. I have to say I also blame uh, the Europeans and the French, particularly, who have a presence on the ground. Uh, you know, we know that Trump is unpredictable. He has been saying now for over a year that he wants to pull out. Why wasn't anyone preparing for a contingency plan? Everyone was sort of living with a rosy scenario, procrastinating on preparing the ground for negotiations. Uh, I think there could have been a, a basis for agreement for negotiations that would have seen potentially the return of Syrian government troops, but under a more negotiated settlement that would have seen sort of a gradual easing of humanitarian services. But doing it the way they did is just a disaster. What about this um, latest news we've had in the last 12 hours or so, these sanctions now being put on Turkey? I mean, do you think that will make Erdogan think again or not at all? No, I think at this point Erdogan is engaged. I have to say, US policy is completely unreadable to me at this stage. I mean, they give the green light and two days later they impose sanctions. Um, at this stage, you know, the US is upset because somehow and again, it would have been predictable that the Kurds would turn to Damascus to protect themselves from Turkey. Uh, I'm not sure what the U.S. is trying to do with these sanctions. Could they try? Uh, I suspect um, they may be trying to limit the ambition and the scope of Turkey's operation. And if so, that would be a positive thing. Because the nightmare scenario, the disaster scenario, is to follow through on what Erdogan announced at the United Nations General Assembly a couple of months ago. They want to establish a zone and move more than a million people from Turkey, Syrians who are refugees there, into that zone. If that happens, we're really talking about a form of ethnic engineering. And we would not just be talking about a conflict for the coming weeks or months. It would be laying the seeds of future conflict. The Syrian regime uh, set up in the 60s moved some Arabs into the Northeast. And that 
ethnic, you know, recomposition of the area laid the seeds of future conflict. If we see a million people being moved into that area, we may be laying the seeds for, you know, conflicts for dozens of years. And you talk about laying the seeds. I mean, of course, the other big fear is these uh, IS, Islamic State prisoners, who are being held at the moment by the Kurds. We've already seen uh, some of their families at least escaping, presumably some of them as well. I mean, obviously, it's very difficult to know exactly what's going on. I mean, how big a problem do you see that? Look, again, ISIS is going to try to profit from, from the chaotic situation. We've seen them, again, increase the number of car bombs that have been going off in the last few days. Um, you know, can ISIS re-establish a foothold uh, physically? I doubt it. Will that give a boost to sort of its uh, insurgency tactics? Uh, yes, very, very likely. I mean, you know, everyone is focused on the few high-level Westerners. I suspect ultimately these can be pulled away relatively quickly if the situation you know, becomes worse. But what about the thousands of simple foot soldiers uh, who were with ISIS? Uh, many of them, you know, there are an estimated 11,000 men in prison and also o almost over 10,000 uh, family members. Who's going to detain them? I mean, the answer is not to hand them over to the Syrian regime, which is known for torturing uh, people and committing extrajudicial executions, because this is not justice. Uh, on the other hand, no one has offered a plan B, and I don't see the Kurds holding on to them in the long term, nor do I see what Trump has said that basically it would be Turkey's responsibility. I don't see a situation where, you know, the Syrian democratic forces, the mainly Kurdish-led forces, waiting for the U.S. army and, you know, handing them the prison keys. It's just not that kind of relationship that they have. So yes, we're looking at a very dangerous situation. I know you don't have a crystal ball um, and there are so many different scenarios in play here, but how do you see this playing out or is it just impossible to say? It's very hard to play it out, but I think there are sort of three constants at this stage. We are going to see a return of the Syrian government forces for, I would say, the majority of SDF-held areas today. Exactly how many and under what terms remains to be seen. Um, secondly, um, the big unknown at this stage is Turkey will take some villages. How far in remains to be seen, and I think it will depend on the re response of the international community. But the last uncertainty and the most tragic one is things are going to get worse for civilians living in that area. And what's particularly tragic is these are civilians, many of them, who had been spared the worst of the Syrian conflict. Cities like Kamishli had been spared the destruction that we had seen elsewhere. And the thought that there was going to be bombing of that city right now after they had sort of Left, been left unscathed mostly for the last eight years uh, is truly heartbreaking. Thanks very much for being with us for your Thank analysis you. today. Nadim Houdry of uh, the think tank, uh, the Arab Reform Initiative. Thanks for coming in and talking to us on the programme.